perspective. So we've titled each each of the decades starting in, in uh, 1870. So the first one will be forts, fur trade and treaties. The 1880s, coal mines and railways. 1890s are the rainmakers. 1900s are portents of a city. The 1910s are boundless optimism. The 1920s are the Roaring Twenties. The 1930s, Depression Mentality. The 1940s, the Second World War, followed by the 1950s, Age of Consumer. 1960s, A Planned Society. 1970s, Westward Growth. 1980s, Garden on the Prairies. 1990s, Balancing the Books. And then finally, the last uh, chapter, uh, 2000s and beyond, Modern Lethbridge. So just to give you an idea of, of what um, kind of information, what kind of photos are going to be in the, in the book, uh, I've approached it from you know, the decade perspective. Um, I'm going to be um, reading some text here. And, and while I'm doing that, um, you can look at the, the bullet points and the photos. I hope that they're large enough for you to see um, it seemed like the easiest way to actually put together a, a comprehensive um, look at what we're doing without, you know, uh, uh, putting a book on the, on the uh, as part of the presentation. So let's start with the 1870s. The 1870s is most definitely not the start of the story of Southern Alberta. The Six Sikhtapi have lived here for thousands of years, but it's a good decade to begin a photographic history of Lethbridge though only a few photographs of the time exist. And what you see on the screen right now, uh, in addition to the cover of the last great intertribal Indian battle, those are about it as far as we've been able to find at, at this point in time. Um, during the, the latter part of uh, October 1870, the Battle of Belly River between the, the Blackfeet and Cree Indigenous Nations took place in what is now Indian Battle Park. This event is referred to as the last great intertribal battle and it signaled the end to, to the Western Canadian frontier. Fort Hamilton was constructed at the confluence of the Belly River, uh, now the Old Man and, and the St. Mary River in 1869, 1870. Uh, and it signaled the advent of a new era. This had the effect of bringing the bison hide and fur trades to Southern Alberta, whereas previously most of the trading was in Montana and in to some extent in Northern Alberta as well. Great change would come to the area, Southern Alberta, during this decade with the arrival of the Mounted Police, the signing of Treaty 7, and much more. Let's now go to the 1880s, coal mines and railways. The 1880s was both a time of endings and beginnings. As a result of government policy and the decimation of the bison herds, the Blackfeet, and other indigenous peoples were forced onto reserves, severely curtailing their nomadic life. During the second uh, Riel Rebellion, also known as the Northwest Uprising or the 1885 resistance, the government introduced a pass system which forced persons who wished to live, uh, pardon me, who wished to leave a reserve to get permission from the Indian agent who had the right to refuse such passes. During this decade also, the, the Galt family established a coal mine in the Lethbridge River Valley when they realized that a railway was soon to be built across the prairies and onto BC. They also knew that a growing country would need coal. The 1890s, the rainmakers. The 1890s started out with a great deal of promise for Lethbridge. In 1890, Several things suggested a prosperous future lay ahead, including a railway link to new markets, including Montana. Other coal mine, another coal mine, pardon me, the Galt Number no. Three was also open to increase coal production. With much optimism and many plans, the community was incorporated in 1890, and new construction began to happen. However, an economic recession across Canada in the early 1890s put many of these plans on hold. Following, following the death of Sir Alexander Galt, his son, Elliot Galt, took the helm of the Galt companies. He believed the future of their enterprise depended on irrigation, 
though it took some considerable time to convince the federal government to support such a proposal. With the finances and logistics finally in place, an irrigation system became functional in 1898. So uh, you, as, as I've gone through these, you probably noticed some of the bullet points on the side. Those are some of the highlights. Um, I'll, I'll keep going, but I just want to point this out in case I forgot to mention it earlier. Uh, the, these may or may not necessarily be in the in the final document. That's that's still being part of the the revision that's that's taking place. But I want to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that will be covered uh, in in the book. Let's move on to the 1900s. Importance of a city. With the recession of the 1890s in the past, and the dawn of the 20th century looking optimistic for many Southern Albertans, the Alberta the the province of Alberta was established in 1905 and followed the next year by the incorporation of Lethbridge as a city on May 9, 1906. Growth and prosperity seemed inevitable to many people. Of course, those on the nearby reserves did not share in this optimism. The land they knew so well was subdivided more and more over this decade with successive land rushes attracting many homesteaders. New rail lines were constructed and new communities sprouted across southern Alberta. Lethbridge became the divisional point for the Canadian Pacific Railway, and a new railway station was, construct pardon me, was constructed, and soon the High Level Bridge took its prominent place on the Lethbridge skyline. The 1910s, boundless optimism. Some of the optimism of the former decade would continue, but other things would change drastically during this decade. The real estate boom of 1913, brought about by rapid expansion and boosterism of the earlier period, came to a sudden halt. The slowdown, the slowdown was exacerbated by the First World War, or a Great War as it was called at the time. Some families were dramatically changed by the First World War, with the loss of 157 loved ones from Lethbridge. A recession during the latter years of the war, in addition to a devastating drought, limited growth and development in the community later in the decade. The Roaring Twenties. Prohibition that carried over from the middle of the previous decade finally ended in 1924. The Lethbridge Northern Irrigation District went into operation in this decade and supported farmers during future drought years. Those beyond the reaches of irrigation, however, were not so lucky. In 1925, immigration laws changed, opening up more immigration to Eastern Europe. The sugar beet industry expanded in Southern Alberta and a second factory opened in 1925 in Raymond. In 1927, Canada celebrated the Diamond Jubilee of the Confederation of Canada, that's the 60th anniversary, and the 50th had, had been a low-key celebration because of the First World War, so no partying uh, while the war was on, but certainly more of a party uh, in 19, uh, in, on the 60th anniversary. At the same time, the community was in the middle of a few prosperous years. Good crops led to a good economy, which in turn supported a small building boom in 1927 and 1928. A new high school, a hotel and more were constructed during this time. In these boom times, however, nobody foresaw what was to come in the 1930s. 1930s, the depression and the mentality. Worldwide economic decline termed the Great Depression brought hardship, poverty, and change to Lethbridge. Coal prices plummeted, uh, adversely affecting the coal mines and the miners. The deflation affecting commodity pricing also included wheat. With prices decreasing, farmers uh, received uh, greatly reduced income from their grain crops. The depression was made worse by a long lasting drought that turned much of Alberta and Saskatchewan into a dust bowl. Some of you might remember a, a presentation we had uh, about a year or so ago about the, the Great Depression. We had a, a great speaker and there's some very good information that was shared at that uh, particular point in time. Uh, quite, quite an interesting thing that has happened. Some local farmers were able to rely on the irrigation system, which is an advantage that, that more far-flung farmers did not enjoy. 
The combination of poor harvests and low grain prices drove thousands of farmers off the land. Other crops such as sugar beets did better than grain during these years. Nevertheless, widespread unemployment was an issue with, which Lethbridge had to deal with just like other communities did as well. Second World War, 1940s. The first half of the decade was consumed by the Second World War. Many Lethbridgians and Southern Albertans joined the Allied forces. A German prisoner of war camp was created in Lethbridge in 1942, with enemy prisoners nearly doubling the population of the city. And just a, a slight anecdote here. Uh, my grandfather uh, worked uh, at a, what he called a creamery, one of the early dairies in the city. And he remembers delivering uh, 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 dairy products to the, to the uh, prison war camp. I always thought that was an interesting, an interesting story. Kenyon Field became a vital part of the war effort, providing air, airport facilities for the Commonwealth, for the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. This was one of several bases in Southern Alberta where Canada helped train Air Force personnel from Commonwealth countries. Also at this time, one of the most disgraceful undertakings by a federal government occurred. 2,500 Japanese Canadians, unduly perceived as the enemy, were uprooted from their homes and, and property in British Columbia Lower Mainland. They were forcibly relocated to Southern Alberta to work in the sugar beet fields of Southern Alberta. Following the war, the second half of the decade began to focus on growth and planning for the future community. The Civic Center, which uh, consisted of the old mounted police barracks square, soon became home to the new city hall and other new buildings, uh, such as uh, the uh, um, old courthouse and, and a few other buildings, the YMCA eventually, and, and so on. The old southeast entrance road to the city, and, and just imagine where Highway 4 and Highway 5 come into the city, that's essentially where Mammograph Drive starts at the south end. Um, it was renamed to Mammograph Drive after Lethbridge's first mayor, uh, Charles McGrath. Towards the end of and after the war, a building boom was fueled by construction of wartime and veterans housing. So those of you who are familiar with the city, you know, the, the Dieppe area as that's referred to, uh, that's essentially when uh, a lot of that was, was built. Uh, the, the properties there were, were acreages that were designed for uh, the vets to actually have small market gardens and, and you know, uh, it, as, a, as a means to either feed themselves or, you know, to provide goods for, um, for, for other markets, uh, small markets. So, um, just something extra for the, for the vets in, in acknowledgement and gratitude for their sacrifices. New residential areas such as the Veterans Subdivision, uh, including along Dieppe Boulevard, were started. Soon construction began to spread along Mammograph Drive as well. And the population would more than double from 16,500 to 37,000 between the mid 1940s and the mid 1960s. So it was a, it was a pretty, pretty important growth period, obviously called the, the baby boom. The post-war post continued at breakneck speed during the 1950s, I guess I should switch that. Um, with many new roads, subdivisions, schools and businesses opening. Advanced education commenced with St. Michael's School of Nursing and the Lethbridge Community College founded during this decade. In the 1950s, the first woman to be elected to Lethbridge City Council, Lillian Perry took office. And this was as a direct result of the concerted efforts of women's groups in the community, a great move forward. The 1950s was also a time of endings. The Galt 8 mine closed, which signaled the end of nearly a century, nearly the century old coal mining industry. The miners bus, a common site, was uh, permanently parked after transporting miners to and from work for decades. The Galt Hospital was replaced by the Municipal Hospital and the old hospital took on new duties as a rehabilitation uh, center and, and a nursing home. 
And this is, a, I always found this one an interesting one. Outhouses were banned in the 1950s in Lethbridge. I'm not sure the same applied to Hardyville. It seems to me, I have some recollection, recollections of even in the 70s, there were a few outhouses out in, out in Hardyville. Don't know for sure. Television came to Lethbridge in the 1950s and many new recreation opportunities started as well. In the 1950s, Lethbridge, Lethbridge could be considered complacent and comfortable. The 1960s, a plan society. After the Second World War, city planning became more prevalent in Lethbridge, continuing, continuing the transformation of the city into a more organized and orderly community. Citywide plans were introduced to deal with land use control, downtown parking, future development areas, and more during this time. Sydney Drive was also developed to facilitate faster access to downtown avoiding residential streets. The extent of the city also started to change. In 1960, Indian Battle Park started as the first River Valley Park of the city. And uh, this was the beginning of the city's work to convert most of the River Valley into parkland. There was a terrible flood in the mid fifties and I think we have some, some photos of that. There might be, I don't see one here. Um, let me just back up for a sec. Yes, if you, if you can see this one, you, you get an idea of, and a lot of you have seen the 1995 flood and some of the other floods that we've had uh, as a result of that. This, this flood essentially um, created a situation where it was untenable for people to live in the River Valley any longer. And um, since that time, there, haven't, there hasn't been any residential development taking place. And with the, the whole river valley essentially being a floodplain uh, development other than recreation development has been pretty severely curtailed down there. Of course, some of the um, utility uh, development uh, as well, but essentially no, no living, no residential development. Um, and the the size of the of the park of uh, Indian Battle Park is is quite enormous and certainly you know the whole the whole river valley is quite a quite a good park system. The city also stretched across the river uh, with annexation of land in 1968 and a much larger second annexation in 1970. The 1960s also saw a debate about the future location of the University of Lethbridge which had outgrown uh, its roots at the Lethbridge College location uh, where Lethbridge College is, is currently located. Um, the notion of whether it should be a separate institution with its own site was, was part of the debate at that time. And after much debate and, and some disagreement, the West Side location was, was chosen for the campus. And one of the interesting things about um, West Lethbridge development compared to uh, continued development on the east side of the river, where, whether it be in North Lethbridge or South Lethbridge, the choice to move to West Lethbridge also essentially centered the downtown so that it was primarily um, accessible uh, from the north, south or west sides being in, in the center of the city. And the idea was to prevent future sprawl uh, in, in directions, uh, north and south in particular, uh, that would be quite costly for roads, utilities, and, and that kind of thing. So it was, uh, it was a brave decision, but I think it was a, the right decision to move to, to West Lethbridge for, for future development. So let's talk about that a little bit in the 1970s, the westward growth. As I mentioned, there was that annexation and the growth on the west side in the 70s was substantial and people came to love the view of the university uh, nestled in the coolies. Of course, with the city now on both sides of the river, transportation became a bit of a challenge. So in 1975, the Sixth Avenue Bridge, which is now the, the Whoop Up Drive Bridge, was constructed to better connect two sides, the two sides of the community. There's also a new, there's also new construction during this decade. The public library found a new home on Fifth Avenue South leaving its old building in Galt Gardens, which eventually became the Southern Alberta Art Gallery. In 1974, 
a newer and bigger arena replaced the old Lethbridge Arena, which was destroyed in a fire in 1971. The Sportsplex, now the NMAX, as it was, uh, as it was named, uh, was the central facility during the 1975 Canada Winter Games hosted by the city of Lethbridge. Let's move into the 80s. The 1980s experienced the culmination of uh, landmark construction of Lethbridge Centre in Lethbridge's downtown, a property assembled during the 1970s, uh, and it was during a sort of a an urban renewal phase. There was something really happening here. There's a, a change in philosophy in how uh, downtowns and, and certain parts of cities uh, should be changed. The, the dominant notion coming out of the 50s and 60s was um, essentially urban renewal where buildings were torn down and new, new buildings and, and whatnot were uh, replaced them. The, the newer notions are try to preserve you know, the good buildings and certainly the historical society has been quite, quite involved in um, uh, historic building retention and, and that kind of thing, advocating uh, to that extent. That wasn't done, however, uh, in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And so, you know, Lethbridge Center was the result of an actual urban renewal project. Also, though, at this time, the unsightly Marshall Auto Wreckers, some of you will probably remember Marshall Auto Wreckers, relocated to the county of Lethbridge, east of the city, from its longtime Cooley View home. And a new fire hall was also constructed at this time. The, the notion of uh, keeping river valleys and views um, uh, secluded from, from view from, uh, and from development was quite a, quite a big change as well. It, it suddenly dawned on people that, you know, there's something to really look at and access as far as river valleys go. And so there's a complete change in philosophy in terms of uh, what kind of development would be suitable uh, along the, um, the Cooley escarpments and, and River Valley Edge and that kind of thing. So you start to see an interest also in residential development, you know, starting to you know, get closer to the Cooleys. Notwithstanding that there are obviously some geotechnical issues uh, with some of the areas that, that have been developed in the past. Nevertheless, the, the idea of, of having view property and the value of that view property uh, started to emerge as well. Um, let's see. So downtown revitalization uh, continued throughout the 80s uh, with the development of um, center site, which was essentially built on the uh, rail yards, uh, the former home of the rail yards. There's quite an extensive uh, railway uh, yard development that the CPR had where um, Lethbridge Center is right now. All of that was moved out to, to um, uh, Colehurst, or pardon me, Kip near Colehurst, and the property was developed for the for the mall and also Highway Three, which used to run along the um, Third Avenue uh, Third Avenue South alignment, was also relocated and became you know the Trojanist Corridor. This was a remarkable development, it created a uh, quite a connection, um, keeping most of the major shopping in the, in the downtown area as opposed to a trend that was developing throughout North America of more suburban shopping centers and that kind of thing. So it also helped to basically anchor the downtown as the primary shopping area of the city at, at that time. Let's move on to the 90s, balancing the books. Although several capital projects were undertaken in Lethbridge during this decade, the 1990s experienced significant reductions in operating budgets both in the city and across the province. This meant that work on such areas such as downtown revitaliz revitalization were put on hold for economic reasons. I think one of the interesting things that emerged out of the 90s was, was really the growth of both the university and the college. If you look at the, the um, list of projects um, that were built, the institutional development at that time, the university grew uh, substantially during this period of time, and and to a certain extent, so did the Lethbridge College. So it was a it was a good period from that point of view for the university. There's some changes in philosophy 
uh, as well at the university, but it made it made uh, quite an interesting time to uh, to be part of what was happening at the university, and as I said, to a certain extent, the college as well. Let's move into the 2000s. Many changes have happened in Lethbridge since the beginning of the present century. Over the past few decades, West Side growth has continued, while numerous projects have also been built in the far south and also on, on the north side. Extensive expansion of industrial development has also taken place in north, northeast Lethbridge. A new impetus has focused on, down, on the downtown through the Heart of Our City Committee, with significant interest in developing and maintaining an invigorated community center, helping to balance growth on the other, uh, in the other areas of the city. So like I mentioned in the um, uh, late 60s, early 70s, by choosing the west side and centering downtown, you know, that has, has been quite a pivotal uh, move in terms of balancing development and growth in the city. You can tell I've got a bit of a planning background here. That's kind of a thing that I focus on from time to time. Traditionally, Lethbridge's, Lethbridge's economy has been agricultural based other than, you know, we, we mentioned the, the foundation of coal, but since then, uh, agriculture has, has grown and grown. And um, are, in addition though, to the agricultural development uh, in, in the outlying areas, there's been a lot of value added uh, agricultural development that has taken place in the city and our economy has diversified accordingly. The college and, and the university continue to draw thousands of post-secondary students to the city each year and both institutions have and continue to see large investment in infrastructure and services. Home to the largest Bhutanese population concentration outside of Bhutan, Lethbridge continues to welcome people from around the world eager to make this little community their prairie home. That is the gist of the presentation. I'd certainly uh, take some questions. Now, I was gonna mention, I did mention this, um, just a little bit more about uh, Purcell. I didn't wanna put this in the main part of the presentation, but um, they've been publishing books uh, in Canada and the United States, and it looks like South Korea for some time. Um, they, they produce quality books, some bestsellers. Uh, they've been working with a lot of good uh, authors, as you can see, uh, those listed here. And they're not, a, they're not a big company. They only produce about uh, 10 to 12 books a year. But again, their emphasis is on quality. This, this will give you an idea of what one of their uh, books looks like. So you can see our format is, is somewhat similar to this. Uh, again, when you look at the number of decades and the number of photos, there won't be a lot of photos in there. So that's why the um, adjudication and selection of the photos has been, has been quite important. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, George. Uh, that was, um, that was lovely. Um, All right. Yes, thank you, Tim. Applause, applause, <laughs> wild, wild applause. Uh, if anyone does have any questions or any comments that they'd like uh, to, to direct to George, please go ahead. Uh, I know we're going to stick around for a couple minutes at least um, to, to go over everything with, uh, with George. And feel free to unmute yourselves and uh, and ask the questions verbally if you're comfortable. Otherwise, if you want to put them into the chat, uh, I can ask them. Uh, Tim, you've got your hand up. Hello. Um, I I was thinking, you know, um, one of the old pictures that I've encountered of from Lethbridge is. Um, it's a view of looking down into the downtown and you can see a couple of the old churches um, in, that are still, I think they're still here, right? Um, and uh, it's from the old immigration center that used to be in, uh, in um, like quite far away from the downtown. <laughs> you know, the, the churches are small in the picture. And, uh, but uh, this immigration center in Lathbridge, it's like where families, 
would arrive in the West and then they would get, um, so, you know, they would, they would be able to stay at the center until they were assigned land, from what I understand. And, uh, and then they could move off to their new farm. Um, and so, um, anyway, I was just thinking from like uh, history, oh, you've, you've sort of expressed the history in terms of structures. Um, the, the history can also be thought of in terms of like uh, waves of immigration, you know, from, from mm -hmm. sort of groups of people, you know what I mean? Yes. And, um, so sort of from that angle. Um, anyway, so. Those are good points, Tim. I'm, I'm not, yeah. I'm not familiar with the, the photo or, or the, the building and perhaps Belinda or I, I see some other uh, long time uh, historical uh, members, historic society members here who may be more familiar with that. And again, this was just a sample. Uh, I, I, I think we're going to be a little bit more uh, comprehensive about some of these other ways. Like we mentioned the, you know, what happened with the, the Japanese and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, Southern Alberta is certainly full of uh, lots of different ethnic groups who seem to have arrived, you know, in waves much as, as, as you've described. And certainly, you know, a lot of them have been as a result of conflicts overseas and, and that kind of thing as well. So I don't know, uh, Belinda or any other persons on the on the committee, do you have any anything to, to add to, to sort of um, uh, help answer Tim's question or address his, his point? I, I can't speak to the, the building that you're asking about specifically, but more to George's point that the book itself will have more information and more pictures than this presentation. Um, this is like the teaser trailer. So there is a lot more uh, information in the actual book. Um, whether or not we've covered the, the building that you're specifically referring to, I'm not certain. Um, do you know the name of it or anything? Uh, yeah, do you know what, I, what I'll do? I'll, I'll dig up that picture. Um, I think, um, I think you're talking about the um, what became the Legion just across from the 9th Street Bridge there. Is that the building uh, where all the crowds are lined up uh, waiting to get land back in the okay. 30 years? Would, would that be up by Center Village now? Um, Do you know, I think you, I where think that you hotel might be. is. Uh, the, the York. No, I, I call it no, the no. Lethbridge Hotel. No. The Lethbridge Hotel. No, it's, it's no, no. It's, you remember it's, where London Drug used to be before it moved? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. Just kitty corner from from London Drug there. Kitty oh, okay. Oh, the, there's the old Chinook. Uh, the old Chinook it was, club. It became the Legion. No, no, it was the Legion. The Le Sorry, you're right. The Legion. Yeah. The Legion. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. See, this is bringing out all of these comments. That's good. <laughs> and and I'm still a newbie. As far as I'm concerned, the Legion's always been where it is yeah, on uh, well, Third well. Avenue and Merrimack <laughs> Ground. So. If, Tim, if you want to dig up that picture and uh, send it in to uh, us on Facebook or email, I'm sure we can find some more information. That's great. Uh, Jim, you've got your hand up if you wanted to go ahead. Yeah, hi, that was fun, George. Thanks a lot. Oh, I hi, really appreciate it. Yeah, hi. Nice to see you. Uh, yeah, I'm on my iPhone, so I'm just not using my data. Okay, but, uh, well, good to hear um, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you bet. Hey, um, there was a, 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 for me, a sad time, and I think you were heavily, you know, you were involved in planning. At, at, you know, when the city completed the um, bicycle trails that went all around, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, and a pivotal part of it was the part that ran across on an island you know, the walking and bicycle trails mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and bypass the golf course. Of course, we, you know, we ran into flooding problems, which I, I think, you know, was probably, you know, not that unsurprising retrospectively. Um, I always wondered why the golf course had that kind of pull that they could deny all of Lethbridge, you know, that, that completed trail. Is, is that something you want to comment on? Or do you know very much about that? It was, it was, to me, I thought, you know, we could have put a fence trail or something along there. I mean, we did it at, even at Henderson. So, uh, you know, that I thought that was a real loss to lose that that uh, walking and cycling trail through the valley all the way. Well, I, I agree with you. I was probably, you know, I wasn't associated with the city when, when that happened. I was, I was still out in the region and I was quite an avid cyclist as well. So I was as disappointed as you when, when that happened. And um, it would have been nice 
uh, had the, um, and I'm not sure if there were any discussions with the Henderson Lake, or pardon me, uh, Country Club, uh, with regard to, um, you know, putting the bike trail through there. Certainly, uh, putting it on the riverside if it was going to happen was was not the the better of of the choices. And I know, you know going up and down the, the coolies, there are lots of lots of trails. And you know, I think even currently there's some issues relative to you know, uh, tracks and, and single track and paved trails and all that sort of stuff. The city has been looking at a, a new River Valley plan as far as recreation facilities is concerned. So, you know, maybe some of that will get revisited. I don't know, but, um, you know, the, um, the country club is certainly one of the oldest, you know, institutions, if you can call it that, in the city. And I guess they just didn't want to see the golf course change to have a bike trail go through it yeah i guess that's kind of too bad i mean admittedly they're kind of the uh the you know the elite maybe in lethbridge and so they got their way um mm -hmm. you know i i think i think i think i as, as as somebody with engineering degrees i think i probably could have designed something that would have worked for everybody but anyway you know that's yeah. that's too yeah, yeah. Um, never know maybe it's time to go have a a visit with Doug Hawkins and tell him how we did it. <laughs> Good idea. Can I be a fly on the wall for that conversation? Because I think that would be fun. <laughs> Doug's pretty careful about who you are. But maybe Doug's on here. Hi, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for the question, Jim. George, I have somebody who's texted in a question uh, wanting to know if you're comfortable sharing which dairy your father was working for. My grandfather. Oh, grandfather. Uh, it is, it's the one that was, uh, I, I can't remember if it was crystal or purity, but it's the one that was converted from the, uh, the movie theater way back in the, I believe it was in the, either the late teens or early twenties. Uh, and purity. that's when it was built. Purity. Yeah. Okay. It was the purity. Okay. Purity. Yep. Yeah. There you go. See? Thank you. Gail and. You guys are so helpful knowing all this stuff. Well, I haven't lived in Lethbridge for many, many years. I'm only, I'm only about a quarter century now, so I'll get there. Did anyone else have any questions? Wendy, I noticed you've unmuted. Hi, Wendy. Hi, George. How are you? I'm well. Good to see yeah. you. Yeah, it looks like you're filling your retirement nicely. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, this book that you're ready to go to publish has a real uh, resonance for me with uh, Alex Johnson and uh, Dan Otter, their book from quite a while back. Mm -hmm. um, how much new material other than the, the most recent, of course, theirs won't, their book did not come as recent as this new one, but what kind of a nod are you giving to that book? That's that's a good good question, Wendy, and I I might need some help with the answer on this one. But uh, in in one respect, um, this is the emphasis is going to be on the photographic history as opposed to the written history. So not so much on the storytelling. So there will be um, sort of the uh, captions under the photos, and then you know sort of a thematic uh, theme or uh, through each decade. That, you know there'll be sort of those themes that that I was outlining. Um, I, I th if, if I've got this right too, and, and Lauren and Belinda can maybe correct me on this, we are looking at doing a, a then and now version of the book, I think that you're referring to that, that mm. uh, Dr. Johnson uh, actually um, uh, put together. And I think that was, was that in the 80s that he actually did that one? I, I don't really remember. Yeah, probably 85. 85? Otter, the Otter book was eight, and and Johnson would have been eighty five for the eighty for the big big reunion of that year eighty five. Mm -hmm. okay. we've um, I'm not again we've been doing some inventorying with with uh, you know the books that we we do have on hand and I'm not sure if we have uh, those still on hand or if that's one that we're considering. Uh, republishing or possibly with some of the really old ones where it's really difficult to get a hold of the material we may you know um uh pvr or you know um 
that might not be the, quite the right word, but scan it is essentially and make oh, it yeah. available that way. So uh, are you familiar with that, that one? Uh, oh, Carol, I saw Carol there. Oh, there's Carol. Yeah. Or it Lynn. was left me just centennial history is the one that uh, Lindy's okay. thinking of. And uh, what we're thinking of reprinting and updating is Reflections Then and Now, which is okay. primarily a picture book. So yeah, yeah. Great. No. But George, you are you are correct when you say that this particular book is less of the storytelling that uh, Dr. Johnston did and much more focused on the pictures and the images with just minimal captions. So yeah. it's not intended to be a copy, uh, more of a, a stylistic homage, if you will. Yeah, and it, it's 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 not going to be. We, we can't obviously capture everything, and and certainly. A lot of things that happen, you know, don't have photographs to accompany them as well. So, mm. um, and and I think that's one of the differences between what what you're speaking about, Wendy, and and sort of the approach that we're taking with this with this particular book. Yeah, the uh, Johnson book was an amazing resource, and mm -hmm. you know, it still may, remains that way. Although being out of print as long as it has been, it's hard to come by. Yes. I believe we may have that digitized in the future, so through the university. Oh, wow. That would be great, Carol. Yeah. Thank you. Was, did anyone else have any questions or comments or discussion? Brian, I see your hand up. George, you mentioned earlier in the presentation uh, that you had to provide copyright information on the photos to the publisher. How easy or how difficult is that for 50 and 100 year old photos? Well, what we're working on, Brian, is is the um, the rights that the that the Galt actually has to those photos, and so you know, we've got an agreement with the Galt to use those photos. There are a few that um, one of our members have taken. I've taken a few as well that uh, that are going to be part of the book. So. We don't see that as, as an issue at, at this point in time. Thanks for the question. Well, this, is, this has been really fun. Does anyone else have any other questions, uh, comments that they'd like to make? Not seeing anybody. No. We, we should add that. Um, as we approach the, you know, the drop dead date, as far as getting a material to Purcell, we hope to have the book available later this year. So hopefully, you know, it uh, can be part of your Christmas shopping list. Good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, last I heard, we were hoping for uh, selling it in November, starting sometime in November. So the timing yeah. should be just perfect for, for Christmas gifts. So great. Well, if no one else has any other questions, uh, I will say thank you very much to George for the, the lovely presentation and for working on this book with us. And it was really great to see everybody. Yeah, thanks everyone, appreciate it. Uh, again, it was just a just a, a or an hors d'oeuvre tray. So <laughs> yes. hopefully you'll, you'll buy the book when it's available. Absolutely, and member pricing if you get your LHS membership. Great, bye-bye. All right, thanks everybody, have a good night. You too, thank you.